South Africa is in grave danger. This is Philip Copen here from the Copen Academy. As COVID-19 spreads around the world, somehow South Africans have come to believe that we've dodged this bullet or we are somehow special. We are not. We are a typical country in a typically expanding position. The problem is that our leaders have misread our data. I'm going to show you some slides here from this week's presentation by Minister Mkhizi and our lead epidemiologist, Professor Karim. And then I'm going to show you why they are wrong. And that we know that we now have a different trajectory. The epidemic has followed a different pattern in South Africa than we see anywhere else. The epidemic in the UK is the yellow dots and the epidemic in South Africa is the blue dots. When you look at the first two weeks or so of the two epidemics, they are very similar. They track with each other. And then on the 26th of March, our epidemic takes a turn, whereas the UK epidemic just continues its straight line upwards in the exponential curve. And this is where I have my first break with Professor Karim. In these early stages, I see the epidemic in South Africa behaving very similarly to how it has in the rest of the world. Our epidemic curve, the black line with the little knuckle that turns and flattens out, you can see it differs from all of the other epidemics. And I've chosen just to, for illustrative purposes, to compare it with the US epidemic, the Chinese epidemic, the Italian epidemic. So you get a sense of how our epidemic compares with most of the other epidemics. So it looks like our trajectory is different. It's unique and it looks like it is not simply due to a testing issue. The testing might be a contributor, but it's not a predominant one. So how much of community transmission is there? Right, now, so Professor Karim is now about to explain to us why there is no real community transmission, and then I'm going to show you why he's wrong. So I'm going to explain this because this is central to understanding why our graph is different. So every country other than China, the epidemic, the virus, has to be introduced into the population by travelers. You have to go somewhere, get the virus, come back into your country, and when you come back, you get infected. When you do, you become the main source of the rest of the spread. And so you get the second wave of people who get the coronavirus infection. That's shown in the red line. It is the first, the blue line and the red line that combine to provide and seed the community with the virus so you get general community transmission. When it enters a community, it spreads like wildfire. And so you get the green line, that rapid increase in transmission in the community. And so you would expect to get the line in the top right-hand corner. Right? So that's that exponential increase. Instead, what we had in South Africa as an explanation for why we have this odd uh, trajectory in our epidemic, if you look at the bottom left-hand side, you see the blue epidemic, the, uh, the blue wave in the epidemic. You see the red wave in the epidemic. But the green, we just are not seeing that community-level transmission at this time. So. Why did South Africa not follow the expected epidemic curve? Well, I explained to you that the first and second waves, the blue and the red wave, didn't really bridge and lead to widespread general community transmission. If it did, we would have been on that rapid upward uh, trajectory. So we simply did not see that exponential increase. Well, I'm sorry, Professor, you should have seen it, because the data is staring right at you. So if you look at one of the most important measures in an epidemic, it's called the reproductive rate of infection, shown as R0. R0 basically means each infected person, how many other people are they infecting? In epidemiology, we call this hanging yourself on the R0 cross. It's not R0, but RE that's the effective rate of transmission. But I will concede in the early stages, 
they're more or less equivalent. However, the most important thing to understand about R0 is that it's not homogeneous. It is not the same R0 on a farm in Constantia, not the same as R0 in a shack in Kailiche. When we look at our situation, roughly, because of the infectiousness period, we can say that each infected person, on average, is leading to about one new infection. And so that's why we see this line. We're not seeing a situation where one infected person leads to many. Why is that the case? Well, that was exactly the purpose of all our interventions. That's How Dr. Karim gets to an R0 of close to one in the South African context, it's beyond, it beggars belief. Right, let's take a closer look at the data. This is from the Johns Hopkins data and compares countries. What I've got here is a plot of a country when its cases start from 100, as Dr. Karim said, going upwards, and it's plotted on a log linear graph. Right, so what he was saying earlier, as you'll see, is that South Africa, we came along from 100 in, a, in approximately three weeks, we got to about 1,100. And most of us were expecting it to continue along that trend and up to here where we today we'd be having around 50,000 cases. Suddenly on the 26th of March, we got this effect. And essentially, Dr. Karim's explanation for it is, while the virus was expanding at this rate in Constantia and Santon, and when it stopped, suddenly when it came to Kyle Leach and, and Alexander and Mlazi, it slowed down. That is just a ridiculous assumption. Here's what actually happened. He's correct in that the first 1,000 infections were from European travelers. And on the 26th of March, we locked down South Africa, and these travelers left. They went back to the UK and back to, to, to Germany, and there they carried on infecting Europeans and causing deaths. What happened in South Africa is we began a new infection, or the second infection, as you mentioned, and that expanded along these lines. So the first thing to note is that co coronavirus is not a, it doesn't follow national borders, and that's our error. We don't have a South African problem. We have a whole lot of little outbreaks. We've dealt with the traveler selection. Now we're dealing with the local transmission. But if we were going to deal with the local transmission, on the 26th of March, we no longer have 1,100 cases. We only have 100 cases today. We should have reset that access to the 100 cases being back down here to origin and then you will have seen we've gone in the period in the last three weeks, we've gone from 1,100 cases to 2,700 cases. And if you would plotted that on a log linear graph, you'll go from 100 to approximately 1,500. I've made it a little lower. And you'll see that, in fact, our, in our infection is, is, is it's high. It's, it's higher than Egypt. It's equivalent to, to Iceland, Finland. We like, we, 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 we're basically normal. Australia is what we like. So you should expect our, our, in, our, our infections not to go along here, but to go along here, and you could find that we could be at 50,000 cases by May the 4th. So we're in a very serious situation here, and it's time for us to realize that we didn't lock South Africa down. We might have locked down Constantia, we might have locked down Sampton, but we didn't lock down the densely populated urban areas. They've continued to get into taxis, they've continued to move around, and every time we allow movement, we're allowing the virus to spread. So why do Minister Mkhizi and Dr. Krim get this so wrong? Well, what they're doing is they're using a SIR model, which is an old-fashioned model that doesn't take into account the vector of transmission. This is the first time we've had to deal with a virus that, that has got such a massive impact on the economy. And it's the essential workers, the policemen, the, pr the prison guards, the, the caregivers, the SANDF. These are the people that are moving the virus around. They are the vector. They are the carriers. We need to change this considerably. And when we say lockdown, we mean lockdown everyone. We're going to have to be realistic about this. This is Africa. It's not Europe or Japan. Testing, yes, I agree. It's very important. But testing where you drive up in a queue of SUVs and you keep a distance of 20 meters between each car, like you do in Korea, that's very different from Africa, where people are lining up 300 centimeters away from each other. 
actually what's going to happen is testing is going to spread the virus. We need to be parceling off South Africa into, into compartments, locking down each compartment and constricting the virus into that particular area. This is a very different strategy from the one that we're following. 